Hello everyone, welcome to New Life Online. I'm Tom Pounder, the online campus pastor here at New Life. Hey, we're really excited that you're watching with us today. And I wanna take a minute to just draw your attention to a few things that you're seeing on the screen, especially if this is your first time here at New Life. Directly to your right is our chat room. This is an opportunity for you to get in the room and say hello and where you're watching from because there are literally people watching from all over the world and we would love to get to know who you are and where you're watching from. Also on the screen is a live prayer button. On our live prayer button, this is an opportunity for you to submit a prayer request and know that our prayer team is praying for it every single day. Also, you'll find ways to connect with a digital connect card or also for you to connect with an online life group. So there's lots of different ways that you can connect at New Life today and we hope that you take advantage of those. Hey everybody, my name is Stan Rada and I am the Linton Hall Campus Pastor for New Life Christian Church and we meet in the Gainesville, Bristow, Haymarket area of Prince William County, normally on Sunday mornings at a school on Linton Hall Road called Piney Branch Elementary School. And I want to take a, a minute and just do a quick shout out to the Linton Hall folk and say, we have some great opportunities for you to connect. Maybe you're watching this and you're like, oh, there's a New Life campus in my area. I want to invite you um, to two things. Number one, the website, newlife.church. Uh, up at the top, you'll see a link for the Linton Hall campus. I encourage you to click that link. Go and check out some of the stuff going on um, at the campus currently. And then your other opportunity is to simply email us. Uh, you can email info at newlife.church. Uh, we'll get that email and we'll reach out and we'll help answer your questions and get you going um, at the Linton Hall campus of New Life. And then uh, something really exciting we've been doing for the last couple of weeks. I want to invite you to come and be a part of. It's a great way to get a taste of our campus and who we are and what we're about. It's something called Linton Hall Live. So if you're a Facebook person, head to Facebook and like our page, New Life Linton Hall. And whenever you get notifications about uh, when we go live, Sundays at 4 p.m., I go live along with my wife. Uh, we talk about things that are going well, uh, some good, we share good stories, and then we talk about opportunities to connect at New Life. And so if you're in the Bristow, Haymarket, Noakesville uh, kind of area, would love to have you come and be a part of those opportunities with us. I hope to see you guys online. Hey again, and as our service gets ready to start, a couple last things you may want to be ready for. Number one, at the end of the service, we're going to share together in a time of communion. This is your opportunity to head to the uh, kitchen, the pantry, uh, get some bread, get some juice, and uh, just be ready with your family so at the end of the service we can share together in communion. Also, for anyone who is interested in being a part of the mission of the church, you can head to newlife.church slash give uh, to be a part of the mission of our church. And again, the service is getting ready to start here in just a few more seconds. Good morning, New Life. We're so glad that you joined us in worship today. We're super excited to have some people in the room today, but um, if you're watching online with us, we want to just encourage you to sing this out with us. For those of us in the room, let's stand. We're going to sing this morning. There were walls between us. By the cross, you came and broke them down. Broken down, there were chains around us by your 
grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens 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 me your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens 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 me shaking all the dead are coming back to life we're back to life we hear the song awaken all creation singing we're alive because you're alive you call me out of the grave you call me into the light call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can hold us down. Shout it out, we're alive because you're alive. Shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive And what a love we found, death can hold us down Shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive Your love is greater, your love is stronger Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me Your love is greater is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me, your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh 
Good morning, everyone. It is so great to have you all here this morning. Uh, before we sing our next song, I just want to share a little bit of the scripture that inspired the song. The song begins with Jesus, the Word, at the beginning of all creation. He was with God and is God. The mysteries of our infinitely beautiful and glorious God, once hidden for generations, have been revealed through Him. When Jesus took on flesh, we got to see the glory of God. The name of Jesus reveals the true beauty of him. Verse 2 describes the love of God, who didn't need us but loved us enough to send his son to reconcile us to him. Even though we don't understand just how great our sin is, God showed us that his love is greater. Now we can sing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. When I stop to think about the grace and love of holy God, I'm filled with wonder. The song continues with the death of Jesus tearing the veil of the temple which separated us from the very presence of God. Now we have direct access to him through the death of Jesus, but death could not hold him. Death and sin lost their power. For Jesus rose to life again, and the heavens declare the praises of his glory and power. As Philippians 2 says, For this reason God highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. No. 
pray with me this morning. Um, God, we just come to you now so thankful um, just for this opportunity to gather together again and to sing to you together. Um, it's so powerful when um, we're able to sing to each other and sing to you together, God. And we just pray this morning that um, you'd continue to move in this place, continue to be in this place. Speak to us today, God. Change our hearts. We love you and we're so thankful for all you've done in us and through us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Welcome to New Life Christian Church. For all of you that don't know, this is Misty Rada, the wife of Stan Rada, who's speaking this morning. 
Dan, you ought to marry her someday. She, that was, thank you. She's a great worship leading. So, good morning. My name is Brett Andrews, and this is... Tom Pounder. Tom. Hello, everybody. Hello. Let's hear it for Tom. Hello, hello. Hey, Tom, what do black coffee, kale, dandelion stems, and the New York Yankees all have in common? I have no idea. They leave a bitter taste in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and that's appropriate because today we're talking about... Bitterness. Bitterness. That's the theme today. So anyway, we're glad to have you here, and it's great to have all of you here. Yeah. I know there's probably 75 people in here, this, but it feels like yeah. 5,000. It really yeah. does. It's, it is just great to worship together again. Yeah, it's good to have you. Yeah, and so if you're watching online, we would love to connect with you, especially if this is one of your first few times here watching uh, with us at New Life. Above the chat box, there's a uh, connection card, or it says get connected or connection card. We would love for you to fill that out and uh, send it to us because then we can get you the information you want to know about new life and how we can best serve you and your, your family. Uh, also, there is the chat room, and we would love for you to connect. I mean, anybody participate in the chat room in here while you've been watching? Okay, yes, there's been a few people. The chat room is a great opportunity for you to talk during the service, and again, no one's going to look down upon you for doing that. We, we want to encourage you to chat and get to know people and share where you're at. So I'm going to be in there in a second, but Charlene Many is there uh, leading our chat host today. And then finally, we have our prayer button. If you love prayer today, below the chat box is a prayer button that we'd love to pray for you throughout the week. Tom. Yes, sir. Did you hear about the mute crow that was bitter? No, I didn't hear No? That. He got fired for no cause. <laughs> I'm full of them today. I mean, if you didn't get geez. that... I mean, I'm going to tell Stan next week to give me some good yeah, uh, get, no, uh, jokes. Yeah, well, because... yeah, I'm going to tell Stan to get me some good ones, too. <laughs> um, if you um, are interested in knowing more about New Life, after the service, somebody who's not bitter nope. is um, Dale Spaulding, yep. and he would love to have a conversation with you. It's called Take Five, where you just talk with him online. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, you can. For five minutes. If it goes over five minutes, he gets zapped with 75 volts of <laughs> electricity and so it's over and so maybe you want to take one or five minutes with him no he doesn't no, okay no okay no <laughs> he's just impaled okay. so anyway um, yeah, yeah that's going on yeah and we've got online groups as well throughout the week uh we have plenty of groups if you go to newlife.church slash online there's lots of different ways that you can connect whether you're a high school student middle school student or an adult we Love for you to connect with one of the different groups. The way that we design our services every week, you may, if you've been to New Life before, is at the end of every message, we have a time of communion. It's a quiet time for everybody to listen to God. And so whatever God has been saying throughout the service, we just pause to listen. And for those who are Christians, we take of communion, where we take a juice and, and cracker, grape juice traditionally, um, and, and cracker, and we remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ when he died for us. So the whole service really moves us toward the cross where Jesus died and the resurrection, which is the central moment in history and the central event of our lives. And so now would be a good time to prepare for that so that when that time comes, you'll be ready. That's right. And also, if you'd like to give at all throughout the service, if you consider New Life your home church or you've just been blessed by the service, you can go to newlife.church slash give at any point throughout the service or throughout the week and, and give today. You can give in many ways and you can give at any point and you can give at every point as well. <laughs> For those of you who are voters from Chicago, you can give many times <laughs> in one service. That's so. Right. so I think this is our time now to shuffle okay. it off to, to Stan. And so Stan's going to be up here right after this. All right. Good morning, New Life. Man, look at that. People. Awesome. That's pretty good stuff. I like it. We're on to something. That's a good deal. Uh, I was actually thinking this service, since it was third service, I was thinking about referencing something about the, the beautiful blonde singing on stage, but Brett took care of that for me, so I don't have to mention it, but um, I guess I will marry her. I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and do that and take, take care of that. 
So we have spent uh, quite a few weeks uh, together now uh, walking through uh, uh, what I think has been a strong series of messages on burdens. We've talked about all kinds of things. We've talked anxiety and loneliness and materialism stuff. Um, and then last week we, uh, we set aside a week and had a really important conversation on uh, the burden of this moment, uh, stuff happening in our country uh, currently and just what the, the whole country seems to be going through all at the exact same time. And uh, so we've set aside time for that. And today uh, we're going to wrap up the series with kind of our final uh, burden that we want to talk about uh, this morning. And what we've been saying every single week all the way through uh, each of these messages, we've tried to have one consistent theme, and the one consistent theme is that Jesus does not want you to walk through life burdened unnecessarily by things that don't matter, that should not weigh you down. There are specific things He wants you to walk in freedom and purpose and mission, uh, but there are things that get in our way that slow us down from that, and Jesus doesn't want us to walk through life burdened. He says in Matthew chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 28, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Who is not burdened right now? Just walking through life, just, just 2020 in general. Like who is not burdened right now with just stuff? And who doesn't want to come out of this and go, man, I could, I could use some rest. And Jesus promises rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so today we conclude this series by talking about a burden that I hate to admit how familiar I am with it. Um, Because today we're talking about bitterness. Bitterness has been called by some emotional suicide. Bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the person that you're mad at to get sick and die. Stephen Diamond, a, a PhD, defines bitterness this way. He says it is a chronic and pervasive state of smoldering resentment. I love that definition. Smoldering resentment. Now all bitterness starts out the exact same place. All bitterness starts at hurt. You get hurt. Somebody speaks out of a turn, a spouse, a a, a child, a family member, a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, a whoever. Someone speaks out of turn. Something happens and you are hurt by another person. And that hurt uh, turns internal. And pretty soon over time, if you hold on to that just long enough, that gets you going down this path of some injustice has been done against me and someone should do something about it. And then that continues to kind of morph and dive. It goes into anger. And if you continue to hold on to that one moment in time, that one word spoken, that that misspoken sentence from 10 years ago, if you continue to hold on, it is going to evolve into bitterness and it is going to eat you alive from the inside out. We call bitterness the the ulcer of the soul and it will begin to eat you alive. Psychology Today talks about bitterness this way. It says it comes with a high price tag. Bitterness prolongs your mental and emotional pain It leads to long-lasting anxiety and or depression. You pursue vengeful acts that make the situation worse. You ever been so bitter you try to get back? It's, I'm going to get that neighbor. Next time he comes over here, I'm going to. And you pursue to get back, and it just keeps making the situation worse. It prevents you from experiencing joy in life. You grow deeper in an attitude of distrust and cynicism. The more bitter you become toward people who have hurt you in the past, the more likely you are down, the, down toward the future to actually begin lumping those people together in cynical terms. All men are, all women are, all of, and you can fill that, that blank in with anything you want because what happens when you become bitter and you hold on to it is you become cynical and distrusting of people and all of a sudden everybody over there is just like this. And you've just, you've just distrusted and, and become cynical of an entire group of people. It robs you of vital energy and it undermines your physical health. Now, I will be honest that there are some hurts and traumas, abuses that have happened to people that spread far beyond bitter and may require you know, professional help and a conversation to kind of work through some of those things. We're not talking about those today. We're talking about those almost minor inconveniences 
Stuff someone said, the little thing that happened, that kid in high school, the one person in college, the, these little things that with, if handled correctly would not lead to bitterness, but for some of us it just kind of takes on a life of its own, but it's really something that we're in control of. We just oftentimes don't choose to, to move forward in healing. Spiritually speaking, bitterness blinds us from the mission that God has for us, his purposes, the life he has designed us for, because we become so blind um, because of the bitterness that we actually sometimes begin to lump God into all of those. If you have been hurt in the past, depending upon your church background, if you've been hurt by a church, uh, you can come to the place where eventually, well, God is like, and it can blind you spiritually to the fact that God is not like, that God actually wants to use you and has a purpose for you. And there are many of us who are walking this life burdened and weighed down with these moments just all over our shoulders and and just dragging us through the mud, blinding us to what God would have for us. So this week, one of my prayers in um, putting uh, putting some of these thoughts together was simply, God, what is it that you want to say to your people? God, God, what do you want to say to your people? And one of the things that just really kept hitting me was that God wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be free from the bitterness and the pain and the hurt and all the stuff that comes from from your past. He wants you to be free of it so that you can walk light. His yoke is easy. His burden is light so that you can pursue him with all of your heart, pursue his mission and his purpose for you. God wants that for you. So if there was one big idea that I would give you for the day, it would be simply this, that God wants you to experience freedom from bitterness through Christ-like forgiveness. Before we dive into some scripture and some other things with the message this morning, let's just pause, let's have a word of prayer and ask God to, uh, to free us this morning. Father, we pause and in humility admit that all of us at some point or another, I'm sure, have wrestled with bitterness have struggled with it, have held on to it for way too long, some moment in time. Father, I pray that today is a day of freedom, that today people will let go of hurts and pains that have been caused them in in their past or even recently in their life. Father, that we would walk lightly through this life following and pursuing you and your purposes for us. Father, I pray that someone would be freed of bitterness today. It's in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. A couple things as we begin. Number one, if you happen to have a, a piece of paper and a pen, would love for you to have that out. You can, I mean, not for taking notes necessarily. I don't know if I have that much to say, but you can take notes if you want. Primarily because a little bit later in the service, we're going to walk, we're going to have a homework assignment. We're going to walk through something together. So something to write, a piece of paper, whatever. Uh, if you do not have a piece of paper and pen, if you have a smartphone, tablet, whatever, um, open up the notes app, uh, open up Evernote, whatever. Just give yourself somewhere to write because a little bit later in the service, we're going to walk through an assignment together. Uh, So I want you to be ready for that. Um, It's really important on the topic of bitterness to start with a really important question. And I think think the important question that needs to be asked is, how do I know if I'm bitter? How do I know? Um, I had had a lady after first service today say to me, I didn't even know I was until you said it. And when you explained it, like 50 things popped into my head and I didn't even realize, like, like we walk through life burdened with stuff and sometimes we're not, we don't even know. It's like, it's like we're just, just blind to, to, to what's going on. So here's a couple of ways you know if you uh, struggle with bitterness. These are, these are clear signs. Uh, the first is this, you're consumed by a specific moment in time. It is a a moment, a circumstance that has swallowed you whole. You can barely have a conversation without bringing up that thing did with that that thing that person did back in high school, that that thing that they said back in college, the thing that that your husband said six months ago or said 10 years ago, or the thing your wife did five years ago. You can hardly bring yourself to get through a conversation without bringing it up. If a moment in time has swallowed you whole and you can't move forward past it without talking about it nonstop, you, you're bitter. You, you're bitter. You, you've got bitterness. Let me tell you a little bit about my story with bitterness. Um, 
So when I was 18, for those of you who don't know, when I was 18, um, just had graduated high school, had just gone off to Bible college. Um, my dad was 41. He passed away unexpectedly at 41 years old, heart aneurysm, ICU, life support for three weeks after three and a half weeks. I lived in a hospital for three. It was really just not a fun time. Um, our family, my family went through um, a lot of trauma through that. Um, I think it's hard to lose somebody you love no matter what age you are. It's always hard. It's always a painful process. But there was something for me about the age I was and my emotional maturity and trying to transition to college and not knowing how to do that without a dad. It was a very awkward time to lose a father. Um, my mom remarried some six months after, moved to Arizona. I was in Missouri. She moved to Arizona with my two sisters. So I immediately felt very alone. Uh, I'm, I'm the only family member left in Missouri. Everybody else is gone. And the thing that really got me about that whole situation was this. I think I had some sort of an assumption. I don't know why. I shouldn't have expected it. But I had some sort of an assumption that my family would reach out. My mom and sisters called, you know, and checked on me and all that stuff um, back at college. But, you know, I, re I really thought grandma might call, you know. Maybe my aunts and uncles who are further along in life and have more life experience, maybe they'll have some wisdom for me. Uh, my cousins who I grew up playing football with in the backyard at Thanksgiving and Christmas, maybe one of them will call and offer some encouragement, a word of advice, uh, you know, something. And now I'm sure that in my, in my skewed memory, I'm sure somewhere along the way I received a call. I I'm sure that grandma called once or twice. I I'm sure that she did. But in that moment, as I kind of grew through that, what I actually felt was that nobody really reached out. I became extremely bitter from that. It festered in me for years. Every time my family, extended family, was, were, were brought up, I, I couldn't even hardly bring myself to say a good word about them because I couldn't get pa past the fact that when my dad died, they didn't seem to care. They didn't reach out, hey, how's college going? How are you? What's up? Like, I, it just felt like silence. And so I grew so, so bitter toward my extended family. And that's what it's like. You can't hardly get through without bringing it up and talking about some moment in time. A second identifier for bitterness is this. You begin to lose your identity. When you start to say, I can't imagine myself without this story. If you told me I had to quit telling this story of pain in my life that this person did to me, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I can't imagine myself pre-trauma. I can't imagine myself pre-hurt, pre-pain. I don't even know what I look like there. I can't imagine myself not being able to hold on to this. If you start to lose your identity and your sense of who God has created you to be because of the pain of another, you're starting to lose yourself to bitterness. Maybe you can identify with that. Fortunately, you've done a good job not elbowing your spouse through this. I'm pretty sure a couple of people might have a long ride home. But I'm sure you can identify with, man, there's a storyline that I've just held on to for too long, and I can't even imagine my life without that storyline. I don't even know how to get past that. Well, now I want to go into some Scripture, because Scripture shares a fascinating story, a classic story. It's an old story from the Old Testament, story of bitterness, and it teaches us so much. It's in the book of Ruth, and as you guys are kind of getting ready, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 1. I want to give you the context of Ruth 1 just to kind of set up where we're going to be. So what's happening in Ruth chapter 1 is a Jewish family from the, the little town of Bethlehem, uh, a wife by the name of Naomi, husband by the name of Elimelech, they are in, uh, in Bethlehem and there's a famine. They can't eat, they're starving out, and they hear that there's food in Moab. Moab is a long way away, uh, different culture, different people. They were not supposed to be there. That was not where God's people were supposed to go. They decide we're going to up and we're going to go because we want to eat. So they leave. Now, Ruth 1 sets up all of this. They move to Moab. When they get there, they have two, uh, two young sons, not old enough to be married yet, but they're growing up. And these two young sons, right after they move or soon after they move there, something happens to Elimelech. The Bible says Elimelech, the husband, passes away. And now Naomi is left as a single mother in a new town, new people, new culture, new religion, all this new stuff, no family, no friends, nobody around, and she's the single mother of two boys. These two boys grow, 
They come to marrying age. The Bible says that they marry two uh, Moabite women, uh, one by the name of Orpah, the other by the name of Ruth. After they get married, maybe things settle down. Maybe Naomi is pushing forward in life, starting to settle in. Maybe things are going well. The Bible doesn't give that detail, but maybe we're settling in now. And then her oldest son dies. And then sometime later, her youngest son dies. And at that point, Naomi has had enough. You moved me over here. I don't know anybody. This isn't my home. This isn't my family. Now my husband's dead. My two sons are now dead. I have nothing. So in Ruth 1, she tries to get Orpah and Ruth, Naomi does, tries to get them to stay at home in Moab. She says, I have nothing to offer you. You should stay home with your families, with your mom. Stay home with them in Moab. I'm going to go home. I have nothing here. I'm going back to Bethlehem. Orpah and Ruth initially say, no, we'll go with you. And then Naomi says, no, really don't. I've got nothing. Just stay here. Orpah, she decides, okay, fine, I'll stay. She sticks around. She stays in Moab. But then Ruth offers up one of the most beautiful and loyal passages ever given in all of Scripture. In Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse uh, 16, verses 16 to 17, um, it says this, but Ruth replied, do not persuade me to leave you or go back and not follow you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. I'll be buried there. May the Lord do this to me. And even more, if anything but death separates you and me. And Naomi sees at this point that she cannot persuade Ruth, that Ruth is going to come along with her. So they pack up their belongings and they make the 1,800-mile trek from Moab back to Bethlehem. 1,800 miles, Ruth moves away from everybody she knows to be with Naomi. And as they pull up into Bethlehem with their U-Haul uh, and all their stuff that they've got left from Moab, they roll into town. Bethlehem's a small town. Everybody knows. Everybody knows everybody's business. If you've ever lived in a small town, you know how that goes. You can't do anything because everybody knows your business. It'll be in the newspaper tomorrow. Like that's how small towns roll. Small town Bethlehem, they roll into town and all of the ladies start whispering, it's Naomi. Naomi's back. Hey guys, check it out. Mo oh, what? Naomi's back. Mo like there's this buzz around town because Naomi is back. And look at what she says in verse 20. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, she answered. For the Almighty has made me very bitter. Here's the first thing we notice about bitterness. Bitterness blinds you to the source of your bitterness. It blinds you to the source she does not take, Naomi does not say in this moment, I am bitter because I haven't handled an ugly situation well. She says, I am bitter because God has made me bitter. Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because God has done this to me. You see, we mess up the source. Uh, in, in, in bitterness, the source of our bitterness is always us. The, 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 the thrust of our pain, the person we want to aim our, our, our righteous indignation at, they may be part of the problem, but bitterness is completely about how I handle the situation, how I handle the hurt, how I move forward, how I process it. It is all about what I am doing with it. But we're not very good at that. It is not our natural instinct when we are hurt by someone to go, gee, how could I have handled that better? Our natural instinct is to say, why did you do this? This is your fault. You have done something to me. You are the source of my hurt. And to be quite honest, when those situations get big enough, those go straight to the top. When you lose someone you love, why did God do this? When someone we trust hurts us, why did God allow this to happen to me? But the source of your bitterness is not God. It is how you deal with the hurt. The source is us. If you want me to try to bring my family to solution, I would say this. As I grew and got older and matured, what I realized was that my family was not the source of my bitterness. My family probably did everything right. If I, my memory is not very good about that time, so I will grant them that. They probably did everything right. I bet they went about business just like any other person would. 
the source of my bitterness was me. I held on to a perceived hurt, something that I felt unjustly bothered by, a pain I felt in my direction, and I held on to it, not once bringing them into the discussion. I was the source. I wanted to make them the source because I feel justified then. Well, they did this to me. Well, God did this to me. Now I'm justified to feel however I want because I can't fix them. See, when we shift the source of our bitterness, we absolve ourselves of responsibility to, to walk in a healthy way, to deal with it. Um, and man, we will do that to God as well. If we can't understand our pain, we will go straight to the top. Sometimes I just don't want to take responsibility. Well, God did this to me. Sometimes I'm not ready to heal. I want to hold on to it. Well, God did this to me. Sometimes it's just because I'm trying to make sense of it from a spiritual perspective. Well, it must be, God must have done it to me. And somehow we just shift the source. Bitterness blinds us to the source and we make a bunch of people the source of our bitterness that don't really actually have anything to do with how we're choosing to heal or not heal. Notice, second, bitterness makes us blind to God's goodness. Verse 21, Naomi says, I left full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has pronounced judgment on me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Bitterness blinds us to God's goodness. She thought she returned home empty, but she didn't return home empty. She returned home with Ruth, who just put down one of the greatest poems of all time, maybe in all of literature, so beautiful, in fact, it is still read and quoted at weddings all across the globe. That's loyal Ruth. She wasn't empty. She just couldn't see it. She was blind to it. Bitterness had blinded her to God's goodness. She wasn't empty. I was blinded by the goodness of God when I was going through my morning time through college and losing my father and feeling the family pressure and like, are they, do they still care? And just all these things going, I, I lost track of whether or not God was even good to me. It wasn't until years later when I started to wrestle through the bitterness and to work through that pain and to actually start making amends and getting some things right that I looked back and went, wow, God was really good to me. He was so good to me in that time. He gave me, he gave me Central Christian College. If I had been at any other school, any other school, I don't know that I would have finished. Any school bigger than Central wouldn't have cared enough about me to, to allow me to do the things. I, did. I had professors after my father died who, who didn't make me take finals. They said, um, we're going to average out your grade from the semester. Just go enjoy your family for Christmas. Stuff like that. Like if I had been at some big university, that doesn't ha I wouldn't have made it. I didn't even see it. That happened and I, I took it and ran, but I didn't really see it. God gave me my wife at Bible college. I, I didn't really see it. She stuck through me through a lot of junk in those years, but I didn't see it till later when I looked back and went, wow, my mind is finally cleared of bitterness and now I can see, look how good God was. Bitterness blinds us to God's goodness. That's why it's really important to write stuff down. It's really important to, to write down every time you realize God has done something good for you, a good gift has come your way, write it down. Because there's going to come a day when someone hurts you and pain enters back into the equation and suffering enters back into the equation and your first step is gonna be to go, I guess God isn't good anymore. I guess God doesn't care anymore. But if you've written some things down, you'll have something even in the midst of your pain to go back and go, nope, right here, right here, right here, right here. God is still good. But don't be blinded to God's goodness because of bitterness. Write some things down so you have them when you're in pain. Notice third, bitterness makes us blind to God's faithfulness. We can't miss verse 22. So Naomi came back from the land of Moab with her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabitess. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is big because God had created a system among his people where if an Israelite woman was a widow and couldn't, uh, couldn't care for herself, couldn't work, couldn't, um, couldn't provide, that God's people would do that for her. And especially at harvest, when a, a Israelite woman was a widow, the people of God surround the widow and care for her every need. 
And in this moment, she believes she's returned to Israel empty. She's returned home empty. She has nothing. She can't see what God has done. She is blind to his faithfulness. And yet she has arrived just in time to take full advantage of the system that God had created before she was a widow to provide for her very needs. God was faithful all the way along. She just couldn't see it. How do I know she couldn't see it? I know she couldn't see it because when she was talking to Ruth and Orpah, trying to get them to stay in Moab, she says something very interesting. Back in verse 8, she's trying to convince them to to stay in Moab. She said to them, each of you go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show faithful love to you as you have shown to the dead, their husbands, and to me. May the Lord show faithful love to you as you have shown to me. Who showed her faithful love? Ruth and, and Orpah. May God be faithful to you the same way you've been faithful to me. Worded another way, may God be faithful to you because he hasn't been faithful to me. Right? We don't see God's faithfulness in the midst of our pain. Bitterness blinds us to the faithfulness of God, and yet she rolls into town, and every benefit of the people of God was handed to her. God was faithful the entire time. She just couldn't see it because she was bitter, because she was so, so bitter. Now, maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've been through an ugly divorce I want to remind you that even in your pain and in those most painful, hurtful moments, God is still faithful. An encouraging passage of Scripture might be Psalm chapter 136 for you to spend time there. Every single verse in Psalm 136 ends with the exact same sentence. The faithful love of the Lord endures forever. The faithful love of the Lord endures forever. The faithful love of the Lord. It's like 25 or 28 verses or 30 or something. And every single one ends with that phrase. Do you want to know why it's so important for you to write down the moments in time when God is faithful to you? Because then when you feel like he's not, you have something to go back to and say, nope, God is faithful. God is faithful. The faithful love of God goes on forever. The faithful love of God endures forever. Faithful love of God endures. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Don't allow bitterness to blind you to the faithfulness of God. And lastly, notice bitterness makes us blind to its growth. Um, Hebrews chapter 12 says to kill bitterness, uh, to, to, to wipe away all bitterness before it takes root. Um, roots in a plant or a tree, uh, they have one job. Uh, seek out nutrition, nutrients, uh, 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 fresh water, anything in the soil that will help the plant to grow or help the tree to grow. That's what roots do. When you become bitter, there's a root of bitterness and it seeks every nook and cranny of your heart and soul. And it looks for a morsel, a detail. That time that person hurt me, I wonder if I missed a detail. I wonder if I missed something. Oh, I, oh, I just picked up a new juicy tidbit over here. I just found out they did. Bet you, bet you, bet you, bet. I'm going to add that into the deal. And then your root of bitterness searches every part of your heart and soul and just begins to grow inside of you until it completely overtakes your heart and soul and you are blind to everything good that is around you. Weed it out as soon as possible because the root of bitterness will destroy your soul. It makes us blind to its growth. We don't even sometimes see it happening until 10 years later. We're like, man, I'm really upset about that. When I didn't even know I was mad about that and you said so-and-so's name and I'm, my blood pressure is up and I'm angry and when did that happen? Bitterness blinds us to its growth. Put yourself in Naomi's shoes. Um, moved away from her home, had to leave her family to go to Moab, new culture, um, new gods, new everything. Um, And then along the way, you know, she gets there, husband dies, first son dies, second son dies. And this is in a 10-year span. How much loss can you handle in a 10-year span? How much? It's not really hard to see why Naomi is bitter. It's not really hard to see how she got there. But by the end of the story, it was pretty crazy to see how much it had grown to the point where she couldn't even see God's goodness anymore. She couldn't even see God's faithfulness anymore. It had grown so much inside of her that it overtook everything about her and she couldn't see because it had made her blind. Bitterness burdens us to the core. It blinds us to the true source, which is us and how we respond 
It blinds us to God's goodness. It blinds us to his faithfulness and it blinds us to his growth. At this point, I start feeling pretty, uh, pretty desperate, like, well, if it's doing all that, what's the solution? How, how do we fix that? How do you heal that? Well, fortunately for us, the Bible provides the solution for bitterness for us. It's just up to us to actually walk in the path. The first thing we must do on the solution side of bitterness is to identify and call it out. This is where you need a trusted friend. This is where you need someone in your life who can speak truth to you and you won't get bitter at them. You take their word as truth and you grow from it. You need someone to tell you when you're out of line. My wife has done this for me on a couple of occasions. I know, wives, you very love to uh, realign your husbands on the straight and narrow. I know, that's okay. We need it sometimes. Um, I remember when, uh, when my, the family stuff that was going on became such a burden, even to my wife having to hear it, that she approached and said, you have got to do something about that. Every time we talk about your family, all you do is spew hate and frustration. I mean, I remember that conversation. That was not an easy conversation. But I had to have somebody identify it and call it out. And then I had to own it and say, you're right. That's something in me that I have to get, that I have to identify and that I have to call out. But why hadn't I wanted to up until that point? Because I felt so justified in my pain. No, they hurt me. I'm justified to hold on to it. I'll hold on to it if I want. I'll hang on to it if I want of it. It's mine. I can have it. Um, bitterness is a lot like a beach ball. Um, how many of you like the pool? Now, the pool is going to be a little different this summer, right? I mean, it's going to look a little, little odd, but like the pool? Okay, we have a few pool people. When you play in the pool, how many times have you had a beach ball or some blow-up air toy and you've held it under the water? You, you stand on it. You try to hold it down, Right? Now, it does not matter how long you stand. That As long as you're on top of the beach ball, it will stay down. But eventually, something is going to slip, and that beach ball comes shooting right back up out of the water, doesn't it? And when it comes shooting up out of the water, what happens? Anybody nearby gets splashed. Somebody gets hit in the face with a ball, which is always the best. That's funny. I'm down with that. That that makes me laugh. Um, I love that. Bitterness is just like that. You think you're doing so well holding it down. You think you're doing such a good job. I'm in control of this. I'm justified in my pain. I can hold. No, you can't because eventually you're going to slip and it's going to come popping up and that bitterness is going to splash all over everybody around you and you're going to hurt people. You're going to have these casualties of people around you who don't deserve it because you won't let it go. Man, bitterness is so much like a beach ball, but you've got to identify it And you've got to call it out, and you've got to quit playing stupid games with the beach ball. With the bitterness. You're with me, right? You're with me. Okay. Then the next part. Um, Here's what I want you to do. Um, On that piece of paper, your iPad or whatever, I want you to write down the name of the person you're thinking of. The the face that's coming to mind, the coworker, the friend. I want you to write their name down on a piece of paper, on your iPad, whatever, or just close your eyes and envision them if you want. Whatever it takes, just picture the person that that you're wrestling with the bitterness with. And then we're going to move to the second solution. Not an easy one. Forgive quickly. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Make allowance for each other's fault? What is that saying? What does the Bible, what does God assume? God assumes that people are sinful and broken, and somewhere along the way, they're going to hurt you. They're going to say something stupid. They're going to do something. How would your marriage transform for the better if you went into it every day realizing that your spouse was a sinner and was probably going to mess up that day, and you made allowance for their fault? How would your marriage change? Versus the bitter marriage where you wake up every day and go, oh, what's it going to be today? You know, what are we going to have to get put up with today? Let's just add that onto the pile of the list of your problems, pal. How would your marriage transform if you woke up and thought differently? There's not wanting to assume the worst, but man, what if something happens today and things get out? I need to make an allowance for my spouse's fault. 
and forgive anyone who offends me. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Other translations say, be ready to forgive. Be ready to forgive. Now, let me be clear about what that means. That does not mean, if you've been hurt in the past, that forgiveness means you need to now trust that person. It does not mean you have to go back to a person who has hurt you. It does not mean you have to pretend it didn't happen. It does not mean any of that. Some people think, well, if I forgive, does that mean I have to go back to my ex-husband who was, no, no, that, that is, it's quite the, that is not what that means. I'm not telling you to walk back into a dangerous situation because you've forgiven. That's not what biblical forgiveness is. Biblical forgiveness is giving up your right for revenge. It is giving up your right to demand payment. When I hold on to bitterness and I hold on to that moment in time, I am emotionally demanding something of that person, implied or otherwise. I am expecting at some point an apology. An apology would be nice. How about you humble yourself, pal? And little, you know, like we, we hold on to it and we demand something of the person. Biblical forgiveness says, I give up my right to demand anything. You don't owe me an apology. I'm not, I don't expect that. I, I'm going to give up my right to demand that of you. I have the right to demand it. I could fight for it, but I'm going to end up right back where I was over here in the bitterness. I'm giving up my right to demand an apology, move toward forgiveness quickly. Jesus says to Peter, when they're talking about forgiveness, he says, forgive 70 times seven. What if a brother sins against me? What if I forgive him seven times? Jesus says 70 times seven. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, sometimes you're gonna have to forgive over and over and over for the same offense. Meaning when that, you write down that person's name or the moment they hurt you, Every time you remember it, your blood pressure may go up. You might get angry. You might feel the pain all over again 70 times seven. Forgive quickly. Move to forgiveness. Give up your right to right. You are, I gave up my right years ago to badmouth my family behind their back. Gave it up. It's not my place. Not my, I give up my right. I'm letting it go. So that requires every time the situation is brought up, I have to remember I've forgiven them. I've given up my right to demand something of them. Not talking about it. It's done. Over and over. You may have to forgive somebody for the exact same hurt a million times, but do it again. Forgive quickly. Give up your right to demand something. And then the last solution God offers is to pray for them. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's easy. I like that one. Too bad the Bible doesn't cut off right there. That dope. Yeah, I'm in. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I can do that. <laughs> but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Other translations say, pray for those who hurt you. Imagine our nation if... Imagine our marriages if. Imagine the church if. If we identified our, our, our bitterness, if we called it out, if we forgave quickly, if we started praying for people who had hurt us, imagine your relationships with your family. Imagine the transformation in your workplace. Imagine what would happen in your life if you walked away from bitterness and you forgave and you prayed for those who hurt you. It's a good thing that bitterness doesn't win out in the book of Ruth. The next three chapters of the book detail more of the story, which you can read um, on your own sometime this week if you would like just to get the rest of the story. But let me, let me kind of give you the, the highlight. It's a good thing bitterness doesn't win out and Ruth doesn't go home with Naomi because shortly after arriving, Ruth's going to fall in love with a man, a man by the name of Boaz. They're going to get married. Together, they're going to have a son by the name of Obed. Obed's going, to, Obed's going to become the father of a man by the name of Jesse. And Jesse is going to become the father of King David. King David, who will be the David who all kings in Israel are measured up against for all time, who someday in the lineage down the road, another man is going to arrive by the name of Jesus in the line of David. It's a good thing bitterness didn't win out. You don't know what God has for your future 
if you just let go, if you would identify it and call it out and forgive quickly and pray for those who hurt you, and when you see clearly God goes, man, I had this whole thing. You should have seen it. Check this out. Guess where we're going next. And you get to be a part, a healthy part of a next step following God and his mission, his purposes for you, walking in health and freedom without baggage weighing you down. What do you need to identify? Who do you need to forgive? And who do you need to start praying for? Let's close with prayer together. Father, I admit that, man, we're not super good at this topic. The bitterness comes easy to us. We feel good with it. It, We feel justified in our pain. We feel justified in our hurt. We feel justified holding something over someone else's head. Father, I pray today you would help us to see people the way that you do, as sinners, as broken, but who are worthy of forgiveness. Father, that's how you see us, and may we treat other people the same way. Father, we we love you as we approach your, your cross where your son died for us. God, we pray that today would be a day of freedom, that we would walk in freedom with you afresh because we have chosen forgiveness. Father, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Each week at New Life we share in communion together some bread and some juice and um, everyone agrees psychologists agree the answer to bitterness is forgiveness the solution to bitterness is forgiveness ultimately as a follower of Jesus Christ that comes from God God who reconciles mankind back to himself the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 that God has reconciled us to himself through the cross through his son Jesus Christ And that that reconciliation isn't just for that one-way relationship, but that actually through Jesus Christ, God reconciles relationships between us as humans. Because we see what God has done. We, We have received what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, through the cross. And now it is up to us to be reconcilers, to go, to to let go of bitterness, to forgive, and to actually be those who reconcile with other people, not only for ourselves personally, but also for the sake, the mission, and the purpose of Jesus Christ. It is God who tears down the walls that divide us in his son, Jesus Christ. No matter what that wall may be, no matter how deep the hurt may be, it is God who tears it down through Jesus Christ. Now, may we see people, those who have hurt us, the way that God sees us and given us forgiveness. On the cross, think of it this way. On the cross, God takes all of his wrath against sin and he pours it out on Jesus Christ. He pours all of his wrath against sin out on his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Why? Because in biblical forgiveness, it is giving up your right to demand payment. Guess what? God does not, God no longer demands payment for my sin from me. He gave up his right. He gave up his right to demand payment. He was already paid through his son Jesus, who he poured out his wrath on on the cross so that I could be forgiven. So that when God looks at me, even in my mistakes and even in my sin and even in my brokenness, he doesn't see me, the broken sinner. He sees his son Jesus Christ, who he poured out his wrath on so that he could see me and see me as a child. And to walk freely and lightly, God gave up his right to demand payment of me. I couldn't have paid the debt. He pays it through his son. If God can forgive the debt on us of our sin and what it has caused the world, surely I can forgive a husband for that stupid thing he said. My wife for that thing that just grates. My boss for the give up your right to demand payment. It's exactly how God treats us at the cross gave up his right to demand payment. As you take the bread, as you take the juice, I would encourage you to focus your heart and soul on the cross of Christ and may that person's name come to your mind that you need to walk away from this place and forgive quickly and begin to walk in freedom today. May today be a day of freedom for you and for those around you. 
Let's take together and share in communion. Let's go to God in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as Scripture says, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. I pray that as we come to the cross, as we come to Christ today, that everybody in the sound of my voice would experience the freedom of Christ, the freedom that can only come in Christ. I pray for those who are hearing your voice more clearly than ever before to come to Christ for salvation today that they would surrender and um, and take that step to be immersed in Christ. Father, in a time when we agonize over a lack of reconciliation, again, we thank you that Jesus Christ is sufficient for us. And as your word tells us, that he has already torn down the dividing walls of hostility, not just between us and you, but between us and and others. And I pray that, that we as your people would trust that you really are sufficient, that you really do bring reconciliation, and that you would make us ministers of your peace today, this week. It's through Christ I pray. Amen. So you were listening to God. What is your next step with Him today? If all we do is come and feel good about ourselves, we've missed the point. Certainly we're here to worship God, but now there's a next step. And so for some, I think it's really clear our next step is to spend more time with God alone. Can you imagine, you know, it's a wonderful thing to come before Him in communion and to experience the freedom that comes from knowing our sins are forgiven and and we can lay down our bitterness. Can you imagine experiencing that every day with whatever burden you have? And that's why it's so important for us to hear God. How do we hear God? We hear Him first through His Word. And then we listen to Him in silence and we hear what He says and we then cast our burdens on him, knowing that he cares for us. So the first step that some of us may have today is to recommit to a quiet time where you're reading the Bible, where you're praying, listening to God every day. Another, another next step for us is if you're not connected in community, then you're going to feel like you're disconnected. You know, the Bible is very clear. It doesn't just say, confess your sins. And you'll be healed. It says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. There's no such thing as, you know, Lone Ranger Christianity. The Bible has given us his church, other people, for us to walk alongside with. And as we confess our burdens to others, then we find healing in Christ. And so if you are not part of, um, of, of some kind of Bible discussion group, we would encourage you to do that. We have over 50 that are available. If you uh, you can check those out online. If you have questions about them, please feel free to, to write us or to call us. And any of us would be glad to help you every step of the way with that and to recommend a group for you, whatever. Um, in this, the, when I heard Stan's message, one of the first things that I did in application was I sent a note to everybody in my Bible discussion group and said, <clears throat> what's it look like for us to share our burdens of bitterness with somebody else? 
everybody needs to share. Maybe it's just one person you need to share with, or maybe as we talk this week, some of you want to share with the whole group. Whatever it is, you need, we need each other. And if you're not connected with other people in the body of Christ, you're going to feel disconnected at times. Um, next, I'm going to cough. Why? It's not like I've been preaching three services. Go ahead and cut me first. <coughs> Thank you. Anyway, um, I was wearing a thing earlier that had pictures of cats on it, and I think it just had an automatic response <laughs> to me. Man, y'all were much nicer when you weren't here. Um, let me encourage you to come back next week, to invite others back next week. Um, Jared Green, who has spoken with us before, um, is going to be here. Jared spoke um, for those of you who are Redskins fans, you probably know him better as, as Daryl Green's son, but Jared's just a great, good man, Christian man. <clears throat> and I was with him on Thursday, and I was like, Jared, it's been too long since you've spoken to New Life. And he's like, tell me when. And I said, Father's Day. And he said, great, I'm there. And so, anyway, Jared's going to be here next week. And invite your friends, um, and I hope, I hope you'll be able to join us for that as well. The final thing I want to say is, um, baptisms, we're gonna, we, there are people who are going to be baptized next week. We have people who are going to be baptized week after that. <clears throat> if you want to give your life to Christ and surrender in the waters of baptism, we would love to help you take that next step. So again, you can write into us at info at newlife.church and we'll be glad to talk to you about that. And I would also say, if any of you want to have a conversation with me, we can set up a Zoom talk. If you're wanting to know anything about New Life, our history, um, what we're up to now, what we sense God's vision is for us for the future, whatever. If you want to talk with me, you can just info at newlife.church, short guy. Or if you want to talk to Stan, you know, I want just write to info at newlife.church, beard guy, or whatever, and we'll be glad to get in touch with you about any of that. So if you're here, let's go ahead and stand. We'll close with a word of prayer. Thank you for giving. Um, one of the ways that we've been flying blind as a church is kind of like, how many people are still part of New Life? What's God really doing here? And one of the things that's been really encouraging is the consistency of giving that people have shown. And that's just great. And appreciate you doing that and pray that God will bless you in that as well. So let's pray right now. And by the way, I forgot to tell you all, if you're here, if you're online, please give. There are many different ways to give. If you're here, you have to give online and here this morning before you leave. And so... Thank you for that. Heavenly Father, we thank you. The church is your church. The body of Christ is your body. It's not ours. Jesus, you are the head of the church, and we are um, the people that you have called us to be, to, 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 to honor you. Make us your unified kingdom, because we live in a world that is that certainly is unified about the lostness of this world, but their message is not Christ. Their message is not that Jesus is sufficient. And they're fishing for answers in materialism and in human power that's just going to leave them more frustrated. We have the words of life in Jesus Christ. May we go from this place today more convinced than ever that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the world is lost without him. And we have been given the ministry of reconciliation as your ambassadors. Now let us go into the world boldly and lovingly, freeing people from their bitterness because only Jesus is sufficient to free a broken world from bitterness. Only Jesus can bring peace within and among people. Um, may, may we be the light of Jesus this week for your glory. It's through Christ I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you soon.